So once again, I don't think this is something as a standard that for, to hold up again as an ideal and saying, oh gosh, I still feel, you know, but it's like, I think once again, it's kind of like he's, he's telling us just like he told the apostles, when I'm gone, there's going to be some trials and tribulations and I, I tell you this to help prepare you for it, you know, that that I think he's just kind of giving us like the, the far ends of the roadmap, so to speak. This is this is how it's going to be. So don't be shocked if you have moments in your bliss and in your deep periods of meditation when you don't feel ill or well, or pain or pleasure, you know, when you lose all sense of feeling in the body. Because he's told us a number of places that the body doesn't really feel. The mind just tells the body what to feel. And when the body gives up its judgments of the world, and, and gives up its categories and its ordering of thoughts, then it no longer, you know, attempts to tell the body to feel pain or pleasure. Because those both reinforce the body as being, being real. It's uh, no response at all is in the mind to what the body does. Its usefulness remains and nothing more. So it's used just as solely as a communication device to, you know, bring the kingdom of heaven to the minds that, that know it not, and it doesn't feel anything. It's kind of a, a little snapshot of what the, the advanced teacher of God experiences. Perhaps you do not realize that this removes the limits you had placed upon the body by the purposes you gave to it. So all the limits you had placed upon the body, in other words, it's got to be fed regularly, washed regularly, closed, housed, you know, all the things that, that all the rules that you think you got to do to keep a body healthy can be removed. Those limits can be removed as you remove the purposes you gave to it. So, in other words, that's why it's so important for us to be clear on the Holy Spirit's purpose versus all of the ego purposes. Because as long as I'm holding on to ego purposes, then the limits still seem to be held in place by the mind. As these are laid aside, the strength the body has will always be enough to serve all truly useful purposes. The body's health is fully guaranteed because it is not limited by time, by weather, or fatigue, by food and drink, or any laws you made it serve before. You need do nothing now to make it well, for sickness has become impossible. So still at the metaphor level, talking about the body's health, but in the end, you know, it's it's just kind of saying, you know, you won't, you need to take thought for nothing. <laughs> you, you need neither be careful nor careless. You need really cast your cares upon Him, for He careth for you. Yet, oh, here we go. Yet, <laughs> this is what we always get to. This protection needs to be preserved by careful watching. If you let your mind harbor attack thoughts, yield to judgment, or make plans against uncertainties to come, you have again misplaced yourself and made a bodily identity which will attack the body for the mind is sick. It's one of the clearest statements there are for, for why we have to be so vigilant with our mind watching. <laughs> So that's, those are just the causes of sickness. Yes. He's defining them specifically. Yes. That's why it's also, when we get into these subtleties about attack thoughts too, is there are seemingly recognizable overt attack thoughts, like thoughts of anger and condemnation towards your brother, but also thoughts of desiring your brother in a bodily sense are attack thoughts. Those compliments that we talked about, like, oh, I just think you have the best, you are, your body's in such good shape and you always have such a good weight or whatever, you know, all those kind of things that focus attention 
on the body, you know, are attack thoughts. <laughs> they aren't compliments. They're actually attack thoughts because because they're they're focusing on it. The, the content below them is, you know, that you're a body and I'm a body, and I think it's great that your body, you know, has this advantage or you keep it in so, such good condition or, or whatever. Or even the brain, you know, you can do the same with the brain about learning, you know, oh gosh, you, you're such a learned person, I envy you, or, you know, all those subtle things that in the world's eyes are, are nice compliments, are, are attack thoughts when they, they draw attention away from the spirit and focus on a small bodily identity. The second one, yield to judgment. I'll oh, go ahead, Dorothy. I found that people will say things like, uh, oh, you did a real good job, Dorothy, and I'll kind of say, well, I had lots of help, thank you, you know. And it's odd, because lots of times they don't hear that, but that I accept that they don't have to, I hear it. Yeah. I think that's good, too, because that's... That gives a focus instead of uh, getting just away from the compliments is to always put it back to the Father or I had lots of help or thank you Father. I mean as long as we in our mind keep turning it back to all my gratefulness and all gratefulness that anyone can direct even towards me needs be directed back to the Father or to the Holy Spirit because that's, you know, that's where the gratefulness truly has a basis. Not for anything that this body has done <laughs> Or said, but the, just the gratefulness for that I'm I am as God created me, kind of a thing. And I like that because it gives it a positive focus instead of thinking, you know, about the negating the compliments. It really just puts it where it belongs. <laughs> yeah. I think this almost brings us back to full circle on our topic of listening, too, because when you look at those three conditions that he's laying out of this preserved by careful watching, you'd have to have something to rely on or to truly listen to, to, to go along, even. I mean, if you, if you let go of attack thoughts, if you, if you don't, if you attempt to not judge in any way, not to judge what what I should do, what I should say, how I should go about solving this problem and that problem. And the last one really is where the trust comes in too that you were talking about, Beverly, you know, about making plans against uncertainties to come. It's just like a total giving over to the listening without any care or concern for anything. Because as soon as as soon as the thought comes in, I oh I must um, do this or else, you know, whenever it's based on on fear of consequences. I mean, that's what uh, most activity through the ego's lens, or all activity through the ego's lens is based on, is it's a fear of consequences. Yes, I'll do this and this and this and this, because I know the ego thinks that if I don't do this and this and this and this, it's going to be trouble. That's where the coercion comes in, right? Yeah feeling that there are consequences to not doing. Yeah. In the end, you know, I feel that that whole section of I need do nothing is the is the key or the shortcut. I mean, in the end, you don't once the mind starts to to welcome that light and starts to see that listening is really all that it's about, then that I need do nothing becomes the the shortcut or the most plain and obvious passage in the whole book because then you don't have to you can let go of even thinking about the body about what I should do what I shouldn't do it's just the mind then is willing and open to just sink into that stillness and accept the atonement accept the fact of of what's there there's no more restlessness about oh I have to tie up these loose ends before I can be still and meditate because as long as the mind thinks it has loose ends to tie up. There's still a bodily identity. What, what loose ends <laughs> in this projected world could there be, you know, to tie up? 
in the end, you know, that's why I feel this is a like it's more in line with the mystical path of of, of just going within. You know, that's been the traditional mystic path is just to turn within through meditation, and this is just a course in helping set the mind in that direction. That one, once it can see the value of that, that there's nothing of value, nothing that glimmers anymore in the world to hold it back, then what? that's the obvious thing to do, is to just go within. It's no longer wasting time. It's no longer unproductive, you know, It really is what I live for at that point. And that point is now. I mean, can you feel that? I mean, as we go into this, I mean, that's what always we, we should just arrive at this calm, restful place of clarity. Right now, it's not. A, it's not about. Well, I got another piece of the puzzle, and tomorrow I'll solve this and this. But it's like just there's such a contentedness, and oh, that's it. Do you feel you've come to a calm contentedness about the whole idea of that you started off with talking about about the feeling guilty about symptoms and all that other stuff, does it seem very different now that we've gone into this? It seems different. I don't know if I can say it seems very different. I feel like there's room for greater clarity still. So if you take that thought, I feel like there's room for greater clarity. Is there anything you can get in touch with? What's that thought? I think there's probably a lot of linearity in there for me. Um, I notice I have a disbelief that that I can be that clear once and for all, and that's it. You feel like you've got lots of evidence as a witness in the past that against that possibility? Is that, is that what you mean by linearity? That Well, I, I guess what I mean by that linearity is um, that I don't believe that I can have all the clarity I need right now and remain in that state of clarity. So it's projecting it into the future somewhere mm -hmm. instead of maybe mm -hmm. the past as you would describe it. Yeah, it's like I couldn't possibly be there yet. Or I couldn't possibly not understand a, all there is to know about this. Yeah, and not in a continuing kind of way. Maybe like it would seem like it, you know, for like right this instant, but it's sure to be gone in a half hour. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, it's it's actually that same thing I voiced when we, you know, when I came to a real clear point when we were having a discussion about relationship, and and I said I, you know, I don't want to lose this. I don't want to forget this. It's that same theme of not trusting that the clarity is going to be enduring. <laughs>